are we a profession yet? I'm going to attempt, in my ill state, to make the case that as a, a newly chartered profession, of which I think we're all very proud, um, equity and the understanding of equity as an economic um, consideration should now be central to what we do. Um, and let's see whether I'm able to do that. Um, I'd always like to start talks like this with a couple of facts because I think it kind of puts things into perspective. Um, in 1862, Emily Davies petitioned Cambridge for equal access to higher education. Would anyone like to guess the date at which that was finally achieved? 1970. Oh, good one. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyone? It hasn't been. It has, actually, which is quite surprising. Any further? No? It was 1995. Okay, now that's not access to science education. That's not access to physics or, you know, engineering. That's access in general. Okay, so it took, you can do the maths, how many years, for that battle to be won. We suffer very distinctly from time lags, okay? So we don't just have an idea and it occurs, it takes time. I'd like you to make another guess. In 1998, there were blank female archaeology professors in Britain. Go on, have a go. One. Two. No. two. Yes, it was two. Well done. Sarah Champion's work uh, draws that out. So I think it's important to just sort of Think about this. I think a lot of young women in particular think that the battle has been fought, as Sarah mentioned, and actually, sadly, I'm here to tell you it hasn't, and you all need to get in line and keep fighting. Um, this is a chart of the proportion of female professors in the UK, national situation. In 2007, when I started working with Anne, um, we were at 9%. It's now 22%, which is a bloody good leap. We're getting there, it's coming. But it's still, you know, a bit away from that line, isn't it? Let's be honest. And I think the E, Equality and Human Rights Commission, were absolutely right when they talk about progress in gender equity as coming through at a snail's pace. It's coming, it's happening, <coughs> but it's incredibly slow. And I think we all need to um, just be kind of aware so in 2008, when I started um, working on this research and this sort of stuff, the IFA had put together three separate surveys looking, starting to look at gender issues in the, in the profession. And they found a, a few things, that the, the gender balance was still in favour of males at that point. Males, I'm sorry, I don't really like female and male anymore, but I do, it is still in this talk. Um, average salary, lower than a male salary, and more women were working in part-time posts. And the most shocking thing, I think, that the IFA found at that point was that women were leaving the profession in their 30s. So they were going through education and training and learning all about archaeology and how they could fit into it, spending lots of money, you know, lots of time. Um, and then they would leave. And this is the situation we had. 50-50 in education. In the profession, it was still male-dominated. And we had this tiny little proportion at the top who um, predominantly male-dominated profession. So in 2008, we set up, there's a, a member back there, the BWA, British Women Archaeologists. And we tried to do lots of things with no funding. Um, <laughs> we, these were our sort of key things, really, that we were wanting to raise consciousness about the fact that there were issues um, surrounding being a woman in archaeology that, you know, I think the IFA, when we started asking questions about why women were leaving, the response was, well, women choose to leave because they, they want to have children. <laughs> and I was pregnant in 2008, and that just really didn't make sense to me. Um, so we started to you know, ask questions about why are women leaving? You know, you don't leave your profession of choice very lightly. Well, um, I don't think that's probably what we've discovered. So we were looking at consciousness raising, support and advice, so network, and that's still what our main role is really, providing 
a sort of network for folk to talk. Um, national role models, which actually that has now transferred beautifully to the fabulous work of trailblazers, who I'm sure you're all familiar with. They're absolutely awesome and I love them. Still voluntary, you know, so bear that in mind. Um, and research trying to push this into a professional arena, you know, trying to make these issues visible more generally. And, you know, looking back now, we were trying to do everything, trying to inform women about maternity rights, you know, for heaven's sake. A few, few women trying to do that in their spare time. I mean, that's shocking. It really is shocking. Um, and we were trying to plug a professional gap. Sadly, we all ran out of spare time. Um, the situation that we're in now, 2012-13, the latest profile in the profession document, shows that we have now that swell of young women being educated in archaeology or actually entering the field. And that's great news. We're starting to see that glass ceiling slowly move up, ever so slowly. Um, the question is whether we can retain these archaeologists as a profession. You know, it's great that they're all entering now. Are we going to be able to retain them? Um, one of the questions, too, is how representative the profiling the profession documentation is. It's, you know, don't get me wrong, it's absolutely great that we have this data, but the, the response rates are relatively low. You know, we're looking at about 30% on average which is actually quite low and I worry, I think, that we're seeing the big units being represented, we're seeing the folk who are actually doing relatively well coming through. And for women, obviously we're asking the survivors, we're asking the women who made it into the profession, who stayed in the profession. We're not talking to the women who left. So we're getting a kind of skewed perspective. All right, so, what are the issues? Well, 2008, we thought we'd ask folk. So we got 84 responses. Average age, about 31. Um, 12 years experience on average, predominantly female respondee. Has your sex had a positive or negative influence on your career? Detrimental. Heartbreaking. Why? During my studies, it was made clear to me that there were aspects of archaeology that were not deemed suitable for women as they lacked the mental abilities. Good to know. In my institution, I've noticed that male postgraduates are more often groomed for postdoctoral positions. I felt I wasn't taken as seriously as male colleagues whilst working in one position. Also, the way I dressed was commented upon. The attitudes I encountered have probably caused me to experience more self-doubt and anxiety than my male peers. These feelings have affected the choices I have made in my career. Many of the women who graduated with me in 1990 were equally good, if not better, field archaeologists, but they took longer to gain supervisory positions, and most have now sadly left archaeology altogether. <coughs> it usually took women in field archaeology at least three years to be promoted to supervisor, whereas men typically were promoted within six months to two years. Poor contracts and working conditions would make having a baby, for example, impossible. I get no maternity leave, no sick pay. And since the company I work for only lets you take holidays, you accrue it, very little holiday pay. If I wanted a family, or a house for that matter, I would have to leave archaeology. It feels like we're going backwards rather than forwards. The situation is not just bad for women, it is bad for men, and it is bad for our understanding of people in the past. I think that a great deal of this is to do with the lack of self-awareness amongst our male colleagues. Too many of them have simply not recognised or appreciated that their experience is that of privilege. Family and a career. Women between 20 and 30 were equally divided as to whether they would need to choose between a family and a career. Women between 31 and 40 
was surprisingly less optimistic. At the BWA launch, one colleague told us how she took two weeks unpaid leave to have her first child. Another told us how she received six months of <coughs> pay. Now that does not sound like a profession to me. And, you know, the very simple point that six months to wean a baby in a career of 50 years really isn't that much, is it? I mean, let's just be sensible about this. Economics, simple economics, parenting. I mean, these are, these are probably much better by now, to be honest, than we've been doing. <laughs> 2008, the principle is that there's a certain amount and it's shared between the mother and or the father, much more flexibility. Um, and generally, you know, this is the percentage of wage. In Britain, it's awful. Um, we're increasing the amount of time that men are allowed to take, which is great, that's positive. But you know, you'll notice that all the politics is about the amount of leave. It's not about the pay. And that's the thing that causes people to make decisions about whether they stay or they go. So we only get 90% pay for six weeks in this country. After that, we get 50% of the wage in statutory maternity pay, which is £139 a week. So if you're on a wage of £2,000, you lose £500 a month if you have a child, okay? If you put that into rent, that's quite something, isn't it? So we asked, you know, who faces this decision between career and family? Because one of the things that people used to say to us as BWA is, you know, parenting isn't a women's issue. And we would say, yes, you're right, it really isn't. Except actually, when you look at it, it really is, isn't it? Um, and the reason that is, is because um, when you're looking at parental leave, if you lose 50% wage <coughs> after six weeks, the partner with the lower income takes the hit. You know, fine, it makes sense. And as, a, you know, in this society, it's commonly known that women have the lower wage. So we're kind of in this horrible, vicious cycle where, you know, financially, women are having to give up their career. And it's not, you know, restricted to our profession, but it's something that we really should be aware of as managers. Now, this is heartbreaking. Do you feel that you have or can have a career and family that you wish for? No, I can't. At some point, do you think you will, be, you will have to choose I will have to choose. Have you had to choose between? <clears throat> I have had to choose. Okay, now that is heartbreaking for me, that as a profession, this is how we treat our employees. You know, we don't often talk about things like abortion and what have you, but your employees will be having to deal with that. Okay, role modeling. Uh, position of women in departments, role models. Some, none. I've had one, I haven't, so it's still kind of split. And you can see a real shift here. So the younger women are starting to see more role models, and that's great. It is changing, but again, it's still slow. Um, God, gender promotion, Jesus. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just gender promotion, it's gender networking, it's gender mentoring, it's gender promotion. You know, we don't banter about football. I'm sorry about, I mean, I do, but a lot of women don't banter about football and that's how it works. Um, and this is the thing that Sarah mentioned, you know, it was a wake up call to me when I realized that promotion actually had bugger all to do with performance. You can outperform your male colleagues, you know, to the hilt and they'll still pass you by because you don't banter about football. <coughs> um, and what it means is that women are chronically working below their skills level. Look at this. Promoted staff to unpromoted. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've had enough, really. Um, pay gap. Um, profile in the profession. Difference of 2,149 a year. 100,000 across a lifetime. They're making the point that it's age-related, but I'm struggling with that because nationally it's being reported as almost back up to 20%. Female academics earn on average 6,000 less per year than their male colleagues in this country. 
you know, and I'm just, I just have to put this up. Look, that was 45 years ago. Who noticed that? <laughs> Sorry, that was close. Um, right, so archaeology is a profession, and this is why I'm a little bit angry that we're, we're going through the idea of an interest group with the IFA mm. because for me it's not it's not about you know it's about our profession it's about who we are you know um take it from the student perspective they, they're carrying a debt of twenty seven thousand pounds now in this country um there's the other debt on top of that that's just fees the average salary is pitiful still and if they leave in their early 30s with an intact student debt you know they we really shouldn't have bothered. We need to join it all up, really, and this is where it is for me. It's not a women's issue. It's about ending a skills drain in a profession by tackling pain conditions and matters of gender equity, removing barriers to ensure we retain people and skills. It's not just about women. It's about curing what has become a relatively sick profession. So strategy for women employees, dead simple. Dead, dead simple. If you want to know, we've got all the answers. BWA did loads of stuff. You know, it's all about more women in management structures, zero tolerance and sexism, active mentoring, transparency and promotion. More data, more, more, more data. Um, Part-time work, flexible working strategies. It's all there, you know. And I think now that we're charted, Really, that has to sit here. It has to sit here. And it's up to us to ensure that it does. You know, there are all sorts of ways that you can do that. And it's, a, it's not about women's issues. It's not about that. It's about economics. It's about creating a profession that looks after its staff, you know? It's our responsibility and we need to sit and ensure that we're able to help the private sector and the public sector in doing that. And we've got a choice because as BWA we've dealt with a lot of sex discrimination stuff and we've handled it pretty well and there's usually been a good outcome. But not one of those instances could not have gone litigious if they wanted it to. Okay. So we're potentially dealing with something, once we're chartered, that has quite serious ramifications if we don't put structures in place to ensure that we're dealing with this. Yeah. That's it, really. Sorry. That was just <laughs> <like that. laughs>